Welcome to this talk about uh, CDI 2.0, what's in the work? I'm Antoine Sabaudurand, I'm working for Red Hat and I'm a CDI 2 spec lead. And my name is Jose, I work in, uh, as an independent in the Paris area and I'm a CDI expert group member. So, uh, have you met this fellow before? Who is using uh, CDI right now? Wow. That's 20 a, lot, a, a lot of newbies here. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, are you using the last, uh, latest version of CDI, CDI 1.2 in Java E7? Who's using Java E7 and CDI 1.2? Okay, now the same. Okay. So we try to, to, to introduce some basic concept of CDI uh, during the presentation. By the way, this fellow is also on this t shirt. Let me show that to the audience. And you will be able to take this button as well. You, you will see that this T-shirt, you have to earn them. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's go quickly through the, uh, the agenda of this talk. Uh, so first, we'll give a little flashback, a little historical respect on uh, what CDI, uh, where does it come from, basically, and what are the main aspects of CDI uh, currently. Uh, the idea of this talk is to give you a, a status, an update of the status of the upcoming 2.0 version of CDI. We are still gathering feedback. Uh, the specification is still under work. So any kind of feedback, comment, question, etc., is more than welcome. So if you have use cases, ideas, remarks, comments, whatever, insults, well, why not? Insults, yeah, great. Uh, just, just bring them on the table and, uh, of course, questions and feedback. So this will be the agenda of the talk. And we have a quiz bonus. There, there are three quiz uh, sessions during the talk, and the right answer will get this awesome T-shirt with the little uh, dwarf on it. So just be prepared to answer the quiz questions. OK, Here go. let's get started. So uh, before, previously on yeah, CDI. Previously on CDI. before diving into CDI2, let's get back in time and uh, get the timeline of CDI. So CDI is a rather young specification. Uh, the first version was released with Java E6 in 2009 and uh, was quite successful. With Java E7, we released a small uh, revision of CDI, uh, CDI 1.1, uh, which was uh, more aimed to uh, third parties, framework developer, and other specification more than uh, user. But there are a lot of interesting stuff as well in CDI 1.1. Uh, the next year, in uh, 2014, we released the maintenance release uh, uh, of CDI 1.1, correcting some little issues <laughs> in CDI 1.1 and adding uh, some bugs? clarification. No, there's no bug in the specification. <laughs> Everything is clear. And uh, in September, we started uh, the work on CDI uh, to specification uh, in September or October. So it's roughly uh, eight months ago. We are planning to release CDI 2.0 in 2016. And in the coming days, we should release the first uh, early draft uh, of the CDI 2. So the, the, the purpose of this draft is, of course, for you to grab it, read it, test uh, new stuff with the coming uh, uh, reference implementation of this draft and give us your feedback. So as many of you don't have a, a, an intimate relationship with CDI. Let's go back on, on the basic feature, the main feature of CDI. So CDI stands for context and dependency injections. So we are talking about uh, a programming model, providing dependency injection, and providing life cycle uh, on the components. So the main idea behind CDI is to provide dependency injection in a type-safe way. So dependency injection existed before, but here we introduce it uh, as a standard in Java E platform and based on a type-safe type approach. Every component we are using in CDI has a life cycle, so it's bound to context. Uh, we don't have to manage the creation of the uh, components. We don't have to destroy them. Uh, also, there is an uh, uh, aspect-oriented feature in CDI, the, the ability to add interceptor, 
on the components, the ability to add decorator on components, and uh, always in a type-safe approach. Uh, another very popular feature uh, in CDI uh, is probably the event notification model. So we have the free uh, uh, observer pattern in CDI. Uh, you've got an event bus, so you can fire an event and have other part of the application observing this event, adding a, a new way to add decoupling to your application. So you 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 don't you won't have your observer uh, know something about the, 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 way, the point where the event is fired, and vice versa. And last but not least, uh, CDI is, uh, also come also with a, a very powerful SPI that allow the creation of portable extension. That's probably the most important stuff because it's the the tool that is used by other specification and other framework to extend the Java E platforms through CDI. So it's, it's advanced programming, but it's very important for uh, the, the success of CDI and the, the adoption of uh, this programming model. OK, let's go through the over iteration. Over -iteration. So in June 2013, we released CDI 1.1 with Java E7. Uh, there was a, a few announcements, mainly the fact that CDI in Java E7 is automatically uh, enabled. Before that, you have to explicitly enable CDI in your application. From uh, Java E7, it's done automatically. Uh, there was a lot of uh, helpers that were added to add introspection about the metadata of your bin, of your interceptor, of your event. Uh, in your application, so, so it's easier to know uh, what are the qualifiers, the list of type, etc., of the current bin, for instance. Uh, also, a feature that was uh, very often requested was the possibility, and an easier possibility because it was uh, possible before, to use CDI uh, from code, non CDI code. So we provide some static way to. Uh, get CDI bin, so it's the CDI object. And uh, we also had a lot of work on the interceptor part to put stuff from outside CDI to give those parts uh, to a new spec to be able to use the, it for uh, other spec in the Java E platform. And we also had uh, some uh, SPI enhancement for portable extensions. Uh, CDI 1.2. So CDI 1.2 is the version you will find in the current Java E7 open source uh, server, uh, and that you will probably find in all the uh, commercial supported server when they will be out. And uh, it's 1.1, but with some clarification. Uh, also with the uh, a big fix to avoid conflict with over uh, GSR free free op framework that would be uh, a framework like uh, Spring, like Juice, like Dagger. Before that, in one one, they could uh, have some issues <laughs> when you you deploy the, the Spring or Juice application in your container. From one to it's not no longer the case. And we added uh, OSGI support uh, in the in the spec. Okay. Oh, time for quiz one. Yeah, the first quiz. Great, first quiz. So there's a t-shirt to win. And the question is, it's a CDI question, basically. The question is, I don't do that. <laughs> uh, which one of those injection points are valid? Now let's go through that quite quickly. So the first injection point, yes, it's a, it's a bin, bin object. Bin object is from the CDI container, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's a way to from have the bin manager. metadata yeah. in, the, in the current okay. bin, yeah. So it's a way of injecting metadata about this uh, object, class is my super bin. And it looks like the second one, yes, but the difference is that the parameter is not the same. In yeah. fact, in the first case, I'm injecting uh, metadata from my own class, and in the second case, from another, another class, another type, right? The third case is injection inside a uh, constructor. My super bin is a constructor of, that, of this class, right? The third case, injection 
in some private method. This this method is private, indeed. Yeah. yeah. It's not a bug. No, it's, it's really private. No, no, it's yeah. private. Yeah. It's private. private. Okay, great. An error. And the, th the last case, it's injection, still of my service, bound to a contact, my post-construct post annotation. So this is, this is the, the callback on the life cycle of the creation of that CDI instance, well, CDI yeah. managed instance. Yeah, post-construct uh, is called after all the injection points. Yeah, the well, when the bin is ready to be used, yeah. right? Okay. okay. So there are multiple answers. Uh, and this time the sure. method is public. Yeah. yeah. Different from the first one. All so right. So somebody want to... So you need to have a right answer to to win this awesome T-shirt. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Anyone want to, want to have a go? I'll tell you what, even in the, we don't want to get back to Paris with this T-shirt, so if, if, even if your answer is wrong, you, you'll have it. <laughs> you have to get it. We are fed up with this T-shirt. <laughs> we have to deck them. Okay, <laughs> okay, please. I'll say all of them, because I don't know. All of them? All of them? No, you, are, you get the T-shirt, right? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Can you pass the teacher to? But, but no, you, you, this is not the right answer. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I want a t-shirt. <laughs> you want a t-shirt? Okay, try your luck for next squeeze, please. <laughs> All right, so the right answer, what's the right answer, by the way? Oh, we have the nerve. Great. Okay, the A, the injection point, yes, because th that's it, in fact. You cannot inject metadata from another class uh, in a bean. You can only get your own metadata. And uh, why is the, you cannot inject in a constructor? No, that is you, not possible. Yeah, say, yes, you can inject in a constructor, but you cannot use inject uh, at the parameter level. You have to yes, use yeah, it at, at the, the method, method level. level. Yeah. And you cannot inject uh, during the post-construct yeah, phase. Yeah, that doesn't okay. mean anything. It's not possible. But you can inject on a private method. Yeah, that's called great. an initializer method, in yeah, fact. Absolutely. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, that's your go. Okay, so let's uh, take some news of the CDI2 spec. Uh, so it started eight months ago, as I said at the beginning. So it's the GSR 365. 365. Very, very proud to have this number. Yeah. Uh, it was the first Java 8 uh, GSR that was proposed on vote. Uh, we have a very open uh, expert group. We are meeting uh, every week on uh, RFC, keeping track of all the conversation. The minutes are kept and accessible on our website. <coughs> Uh, the people working on the reference implementation, which, is, which would be a JBus Weld, uh, are releasing on a regular basis alpha of this implementation. Right until now, it was more for uh, testing ideas and seeing how we can uh, uh, take advantage of Java 8 stuff and so on. Uh, we have a lot of community momentum, so a lot of people uh, not coming from the expert group. Uh, uh, asking questions, giving feedback, giving uh, ideas, and so on. So it, it's quite cool, and, and we'd like to, to see that uh, continue. As I said, the early draft is around the corner. I'm saying yeah. that. I'm keeping saying that, but uh, it's true. <laughs> it, 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 it really will become true at the end. Around. And we still expect to release it uh, yes, next we, year. We expect. We do not accept. Yeah, but expect. Yes. Ex uh, accepted. Yeah, it's the, yeah. Well, <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I listed here all the expert group members. It's not to give them their biography, but it's to show you that there are people coming from very different uh, horizon. Of course, we've got all the the major actor in the uh, in the EE world. So Red Hat, of course, we are leading the specification, but. Uh, also IBM, Oracle, and others. But the, we have also in the spec individuals uh, with different experience uh, in development. So we, we've got what we are calling in the specification on users, but advanced on users interested in the spec. So I think it's important to have different point of view and not only uh, uh, integrator or uh, uh, vendor point of view. That's a good stuff for our spec. Uh, to let you know that the expert group is still open. You can join when you want. In fact, we are taking ideas from the community, as I said. When someone which is not in an expert group wants to contribute more than ideas, and contribute code or uh, text in the specification, uh, we ask them to join the expert group for IP issue or things like that. OK, I finish with that. We are open. You can join us uh, mainly through the mailing list, but we have many other ways to, to communicate with you. You have all this information on the website. 
Great. Okay. And now, yes. So about features. Uh, in fact, CDI 2.0 began by a feedback gathering. Um, the first big step in this feedback gathering was the, was the survey. We're going to talk a little more about that. But feedback gathering comes from many sources. A former expert group members, in fact, are still part of the new uh, CDI 2.0 uh, expert group. Other specs feedback from EGB, from Servlet, from JPA, from Interceptor, from many JAX arrests, of course. Uh, JIA requests. There are really many ways to, to provide feedback to the, to the specification. Uh, there was this CDI 2.0 survey, 260 uh, participants. It's quite a lot, in fact, for this kind of survey. Qu quite happy with that. With 20 features to rate. And uh, the first feature that really struck us was, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's not this one. Uh, who answered? Basically, mainly uh, regular CDI developers. Uh, almost 70% uh, of people were like that, and almost 10% were framework, uh, CDI framework developers, which is probably a bit overrepresented. Those people are very active in the community. Yeah, but it and did, it, uh, give an idea of the, their expectation. Yes, of course. It also gives the idea of, of what, what do they expect exactly. Most of the people are uh, Java EE developers and use CDI in the Java EE context, but they are still uh, rather 25% of the people who are using CDI out of the Java EE context. And so far, uh, whether it is in Java, in plain Java IC applications, or for instance in Topcat, it's quite painful to bootstrap CDI in those contexts. It's yeah. not specified, and it relies on uh, vendor-specific yeah, implementations. Uh, implementations. Yeah. So we need to fix that, and it's going to be fixed in, uh, in CDI 2.0. The first uh, feature that really struck us was alignment with Portlet 3.0, which was quite unexpected, in fact, but there are people really willing to have that. Well, it, it was not the top requested feature, but the least requested feature. Number 20 still, from 20. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, we absolutely, well, we probably need to look into that anyway. The uh, top requested feature was asynchronous support in CDI 2.0, and it took context for event notifications the event bus is mainly synchronous so far, so it needs to go uh, asynchronous, and we are going to see that because it's already, most of it is already in the upcoming uh, early draft. And method invocation, we need to think more about this one because it has not been done yet, so we're still open for feedback once again. Uh, other top requested feature, bootstrapping CDI outside of Java EE container, AOP for custom beans, we're going to talk about that, security support, we are not going to talk about that much more because no. it's not done yet, but it's, it's in the way. Uh, observers ordering, this is part of the event bus. We're going to, to talk about that through. And access to metadata uh, through the SPI. And this is also something we are going to, to talk about. Yeah. OK. Uh, regarding, just regarding security, we are waiting because we are waiting to see the work done by the, security, yeah. the new security specification to uh, avoid Doing the work there, there is a security yeah. expert group, and by the way, they are talking yeah. just, uh, just after us. Oh, time for quiz two. Yeah. Great. All right. So another T-shirt to win. Please help us, guys. Help us. <laughs> we, we need to get rid of those. <laughs> All right. Which producers are valid? Ah, this is an application scope beam. So it's basically it means that it's a beam managed yeah. uh, object. So just for people that don't know, uh, doesn't know, don't know uh, CDI, a producer are a way to create a bin uh, without creating a class. So it's a way to having uh, the, return, the return object from a method used as a bin, yeah. injectable and so on. Absolutely. So obviously you need to annotate some kind of method with producers, but you can also annotate fields with the producer's yeah. annotation. Don't have to put that on methods. Uh, so the first injection point, it's a regular, regular method, returns my service, yeah. takes an injection point, and a bean, you know, we, saw, we already saw that bean object yeah. uh, on the previous quiz, my service metadata. So it's basically, uh, it received the injection point and the metadata uh, of, the, of, the, of the bean. All right, great. Second method, ah, the second method is session scope. It's an HTTP sense, right? Yeah, it's uh, one of a scope and one of a built-in scope in CDI, but it comes okay. from HTTP. Okay, so is it, is it valid or not? The third method returns a map and takes an injection point as a parameter. It's public, all right? And the last method, old, last method doesn't get the injection point as a parameter. Yeah. It returns a map. Well, the map is not exactly the same. It has yeah, not the same the, type. There is a wild card in the yeah. parameter it's not, of the type. It's not the same parameter of the type. So any ID? Right. 
Any idea, anyone? Yeah, you raised your hand. No, no, no. you didn't scratch your head. You raised your hand, I saw you. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> A and B. A and B, right. Maybe there's a second T-shirt to one. You, you, you raise your hand too, yeah? A and C. A and C. You get the T-shirt? Yeah. And you get the T-shirt too, all right? So that's two T-shirts for the yeah. price of one. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I love it. Up. And the correct answers were A and, A and C. A and C. All right. So, so you, 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 right you, you will be able to take an extra button. Even Sorry? if they are free. Yeah, but I'm here. Uh, yes, they are. Yes, the thing. Okay, A and B. So, okay. So, wh why can't I in, uh, produce this map? What's, what's the deal with this special map? Uh, because I have a wildcard in my parameter. Ah. It's forbidden by the specification. So I cannot produce the parameter with wildcards in them. No. Yes, that makes sense. In fact, and, uh, and, I, cannot, and I cannot produce. And I cannot inject injection points in my producer yeah. if I am in a session scope. Uh, in fact, I have to be in a dependent scope to uh, okay. be able to do that. So this is the point. The session scope um, is wrong, in fact. Yeah. In this round. Okay, great. CDI2 new features. At least. So, uh, as we said in the beginning of the, of the talk, one of the most uh, requested features is probably the, the possibility to boot CDI from outside the Java IE container. Uh, so for what reason would we uh, want to do that? Uh, the main, first obvious reason is to provide an easier way to test uh, CDI application. Uh, having, the cap having the possibility to boot your CDI application, your CDI code from uh, the uh, Java IC uh, uh, could make the, it easier to test. That's for the first. But we also have a lot of people that uh, wanted to use CDI as an integration solution for uh, uh, a stack, uh, for instance, with uh, JAXRS, GPA, and only uh, a few parts of the Java E specification. And they wanted to be able to build that without uh, the Java E container. Uh, another point is uh, linked to the fact that other spec today uh, support Java EC. For instance, if you take uh, GPA, if you take JAXRS, uh, those works uh, out of the box on Java IC in the spec. And they come to us and said, OK, you have a nice specification, a nice programming model, but if we adopt your uh, specification, what happens when a user uh, uses us in, in Java IC? We cannot rely on you. So uh, the fact of adding this feature will boost the adoption of CDI in other spec. And another point, I will come back uh, on this point later, but it's, if we go that way, it, it will be the first step to provide uh, another version of CDI, CDI Lite, uh, which could also help um, developers to, to adopt CDI uh, in, uh, easily. So the good news is that this uh, Java IC support is included in the uh, early draft which is around the corner. <laughs> Keep repeating yeah. it. <laughs> the next corner. So we specify an, ap an API to boot CDI in Java SE. It's very straightforward API right now. We use already existing uh, class uh, in CDI. Taking the, yeah. uh, CDI provider and CDI uh, interface. Uh, so we are using the uh, service loader from Java IC, introduced in Java IC 6, to get a provider. Oops. And uh, with this uh, uh, CDI provider, we can initialize a container. And this initialization returns a handler on the CDI container with this, the CDI object you see there. Uh, the CDI object will be used after that to request bin on the container from their type, from their qualifier, and so on. After you have worked with the bin you get uh, in the container, you can shut down the <coughs> container you have uh, initialized at the beginning, and uh, that's it. And you can, if you want, start another container, and so on. <coughs> Of course, you, you can also forget the CDI shutdown since the CDI uh, interface 
Also extend the auto-closable interface, so implement the close uh, method that will be called at the end of the application if you forget to shut down the, the container. So now with that, desktop and non-Java IE application, Java IE application can uh, use CDI without uh, Java IE. You, you see, there was two, two simple uh, object and simple call to do that. But we have to do, we have to do a lot of things to reach this point. In fact, if you read the specification right now, the 1.2 specification, you'll see that uh, all the Java uh, uh, feature of a spec uh, are very uh, integrated in CDI, especially AGB specification, servlet specification, and GSF specification. So the first thing we had to do to do that is to split the CDI specification in two uh, parts. So we had to create a CDI core part, which is the, all the CDI features that are uh, independent of Java IE, and put in another part the, all the specific features of CDI when it's running in Java IE. So it was a very uh, long uh, uh, work because it, we had to to split it without, forget, without losing information or creating new information in the process. And afterward, we could work to add a new part, CDI for Java IC. So right now, this part CDI for Java IC is a very small part. It's only integrate the, the boot stuff we, we saw that, but in the, the future, it, we have, there will be a bit more in it, but it was the, the, the the big work behind this, uh, this feature. And there's still work to do. So here we saw how we can boot the container, but we have a question about what to do with the built-in context in CDI, so the specification provides built-in context for application scope, request scope, session scope, conversation scope. For application scope, it's quite uh, obvious. Application scope will be up during the, all the application life, but what about request, session, conversation? We have to discuss that and decide if they are active, inactive, if we can activate it at will, and so on. Another uh, point we have to deal with on this Java IC part uh, is about the bin discovery in Java, in uh, CDI bin discovery, sorry, in Java IC. So in CDI, you have a, a mechanism to discover bin by scanning uh, the, the jar uh, on the class path. It's quite simple to do when you are in a, a Java IE module in a war because you are only scanning the, the jar in the, uh, in the module. But when you are in Java IC, you can start scanning all the class path. So it can be very, very uh, uh, costly to do that. Uh, especially when you are in annotated mode. Annotated mode is uh, a mode where you have to scan all the annotation on all the class to decide if this class uh, is candidate to become a bin or not. And even more, if you are using the uh, implicit bin archive, which is the mechanism that activates CDI automatically, so you don't have to put anything in your, uh, uh, in your archive to activate CDI. And the, mechan the discovery mechanism has to scan every uh, every jar on a class pass. And if there is uh, a bin XML, OK, uh, the, the content will become, uh, the class content in the jar will become bins. If there is no bin XML with the implicit bin archive, I have to look at all the class and decide one by one if I have to make them a bin. So we have a lot of things to imagine, perhaps to add a new bin discovery mode to avoid uh, having uh, five minutes boot time on Java IC application, <laughs> for instance. And another point that could be interesting, or not, that should be discussed, is the possibility to, to have multiple containers in Java IC. As you saw in the code I showed you before, I could have launched another uh, container, another CDI provider, provider initialized, uh, in my code and have two containers. So is it interesting to have that? Some people in the expert group think uh, yes, others no. 
So uh, discussion will go on on that point. And that's all for Java SE. So that brings us to another uh, uh, important feature uh, for CDI2. We want to add uh, uh, the possibility to run the spec more modular, add modularity to the spec. Uh, the idea is to be able to provide sub-spec, uh, sub which could, for instance, help us to uh, create a light version of CDI. So the idea behind that is to avoid having a, a bloated spec. Uh, we saw in the past over spec getting more and more feature, becoming more bigger and bigger. Uh, we want to do everything we can to avoid that for CDI. Uh, we have over a spec that told us that CDI is nice, but it's too big, but the implementation is too, are too heavy, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, providing uh, a sub, an extract of the uh, CDI API of a CDI spec could help those to say, OK, I have a version of CDI very simple with a dep basic dependency ejection event. OK, I take that. I, I take that. It's quite simple. I can go that way. So again, to boost the adoption of the, of the spec. So right now, the idea is to have two parts. So to have a CDI light part, which would provide uh, basic CDI, basic dependency injection, sorry, <laughs> producers, uh, programmatic lookup, which is the mechanism uh, that allow you to resolve bin at runtime. Uh, uh, on the scope side, uh, supporting only singleton on dependent scope, so all the scope that uh, doesn't, don't need proxies at runtime. Uh, provide events and a basic uh, SPI integration. And the second part would be the full CDI, taking all the stuff in the CDI light and add to them normal <coughs> scope. So that would be the request scope, session scope, application scope, uh, all the AOP part and add advanced SPI. In fact, it's all the feature that uh, requires uh, proxies in the uh, implementation. That, fits, that feature won't be in the early draft. It's still to be discussed because, because, because it's quite easy to do if we want to go that way. Uh, if we want to be consistent with this approach, we will have to provide four subspec, as you see. We have the AC and EE, and we have to decline AC, light, and full, full etc., etc. So that means four uh, spec, four subspec, 40 CK for area. So uh, a lot of people are interested by that, but we have to, to, to hear very loud feedback, positive loud feedback to, to say, OK, <laughs> that's worth going that way. That's all for modularity, I think. Let's ah. talk about events. Enhancing events. Uh, yes, the event bus is a very popular feature of CDI, and I think we have a third quiz for that <laughs> with another T-shirt. Now, now you will launch the T-shirt in the crowd, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, hang on, we, are, we haven't come to the question. All right, so what it is about? We inject this invent object that is with a parameter, post. Let's call the, the object post event. And we have this save new post method that takes a post. And uh, post event, we select Oh, there's a lambda expression there. Oh, yes, yeah. CDI 2.0 is aligned with Java 8, so we can use lambdas. And in fact, this French.class is an interface. It's an annotation. Yeah, it's a qualifier, in ah, fact. Ah, it's a qualifier, yeah. And uh, we can instantiate annotation using this lambda expression yeah. with that, because this is, in fact, an implementation of the annotation interface itself, which is a functional interface implementing with a lambda expression. And then we fire, using this qualifier, we fire the post uh, object, which is the payload of the events. And we got four observers. The first one observes the French events. The French here is the annotation, the qualifying annotation, the qualifier annotation, sorry. We also observe the English events, which is probably another qualifier uh -huh. they find somewhere else. We also observe the post object without, without any qualifier. Any qualifier yeah. And we also observe a plain object. So, object, object. obviously, a superclass of the post object with no qualifier. 
All right, and the question is, which of the observer will be triggered by the fire call at the top of the class? Any idea, someone? Yes. Yeah. A. A? That's a t-shirt. Yes, sure? it's a t-shirt, but we've got another one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there was another, yeah? A, and not, not the others. Okay, does that the t-shirt now? Because the answer is wrong, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We got one last t-shirt for the for, for the for the year. Okay, uh, it turns out that it's A, C, and D. Yes, because the post object with no qualifier will be will get the fire whatever the whatever wherever it comes from, and uh, for uh, assignable reasons, yeah. the last observer will also be called by the by this fire event. Okay, great. So what's the deal with enhancing events? We're going to talk about two things. First, asynchronous events and events ordering. Let's go through the pattern. So basically in CDI1, I've got this event object with a parameter which is the payload of the event. And in my business method, I can fire a payload to the observers. It allows me to completely decouple certain parts of my applications, the firing side and the observing side. How can I observe that? Just create a method in any kind of and uh, manage object, of course, and get the, uh, put the observed annotation on the parameter of the method, and you'll get uh, the payload, and you'll be called by the, by the fire uh, of the event. It also supports qualifiers and other uh, CDI stuff. We're going, not going into much details about that. All right, so what does it mean to go asynchronous? For us, you have to, to take into account that the synchronous or asynchronous nature of this event, of this way of uh, firing an observing event, is not explicitly specified in the CDI, CDI1 spec, nor is the immutable status of the payload event. So you could have, you can have, and people did that, a mutable payload, which is of course something to take into account. The implementations so far, there are several implementations of CDI, uh, uses a synchronous uh, model, and people have been using mutable payload uh, in some implementations and some frameworks. So of course, if we want to build backward compatible spe specification, and of course we want to do that, we need to take that into account. If we're going asynchronous in a, in a blindly way, okay, let's go asynchronous, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be in trouble. It will, it will not just not work, in fact. Right now, all the observers are called in the same thread as the thread that is firing the event. And they are called in a synchronous way. The order is not specified, so there's no particular order. You cannot rely on that or you cannot anticipate that. This is going to be fixed in a CDI 2.0. And uh, people uh, took the habit to mutate the payload, so you can have a payload mutated in the first observer and then get the result, some kind of result in the second observer and stuff like that. So, of course, you, you'll go in trouble if you, if you do that in an in a, um, asynchronous way. The second aspect to, to take into account is the aspect of context. Uh, there are contexts in CDI. CDI is used in a servlet environment, whether it is JAXRS, web services, uh, JSF, of mm -hmm. course. You also have CDI in transactional contexts. So those two categories, two families of contexts are really critical in, in CDI. HTTP context on one side, request, conversation, session, and application, and the transactional context in which you can, of course, uh, conduct uh, persistent operations. And basically, those two kinds of contexts are thread bound. The, the paradigm is to say one request, one thread, one EGB, one thread, one transaction, one thread. So if we decide to go asynchronous here, you need to t we need to take that into account too. Events are, of course, aware of those contexts. You can, even, you can even put events on the transaction callback, for instance, to get the, the synchronization transaction uh, object uh, in, a, in, a, in a CDI observer. Right. So if everything is synchronous, everything will be fine. If we want to go async, we need to be extra careful here. If we don't take that into account, we'll be in big trouble, and all the application will break. So designing a backward compatible async event, it's more tricky than it looks. So this is, this is the point here. If I have a currently synchronous event, 
Maybe that event is mutating its payload. Maybe it's doing some kind of uh, transaction. request transaction, etc. So it needs to remain synchronous. If I decide to go synchronous or asynchronous, this is a decision that should be taken from the firing side because from the firing side, I know if I am firing an immutable payload or not. And if I want to remain synchronous, for instance, if I want to remain called in the transactional thread, then this, is, this should be a decision. Uh, you should be able to take that decision from the observing side, because in the observer, I know if I want to mutate the payload, or I know if I want to conduct some kind of persistent operations. All right, so we came with a pattern from the firing side fire a sync, provide the payload as a parameter. And we have another pattern on the uh, observing side, same, one, same at this one. This uh, observer will be called synchronously, despite the fact that it might have been fired, this event might have been fired asynchronously. And on the other side, if I want to observe this event in an asynchronous way, I've got another annotation, observed async, which tells the firing side, yes, I am OK to be called in an asynchronous way. But it's not quite over. Even with that, we need to be careful. There's still one uh, case which, is, which might raise problems. So basically, I've got two ways of firing events, synchronous, asynchronous, and two ways of observing them, synchronous and asynchronous. If I fire synchronously and uh, observe synchronously, all right, this event will be called synchronously in the same thread as the firing event. This is the case for CDI1. But if I decide to fire the events in an asynchronous way, but observe in a synchronous way, then this observer it might be conducting some kind of persistent operation, so it should stay in the same thread as the firing the side. Okay, so this should be a synchronous call too. And the other, uh, the third case, if I fire a sync and decide to observe a sync, then it's okay, I will be called in another thread. This is a pure asynchronous call. So far, in the, uh, implement, in the specification where we wrote, uh, firing an event in a synchronous way and observing in an asynchronous way uh, um, doesn't lead to anything, the observer will not be called. If it is to be called, we need to be careful, it should be called in a synchronous way. Why? Because if the firing side is firing a mutable payload and some synchronous observers are mutating it, I'll be in trouble uh, while observing it in another thread. I will run into race conditions, and this I don't want. So I should be called in a synchronous way, but it's not the case for the moment. Right. What about mutable payload? One short answer, don't do it. Everybody agrees? OK, right. If you do it, you will suffer the full penalty of race conditions, I can tell you. Right. Let us go back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. There, there, there's, a, there's a present for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you said yes. <laughs> okay. Let us go back to this pattern. I am currently firing a payload. What about, two questions, what about if I want this observer to be called in a special thread? And there are use cases for that. And second question, what if exceptions are thrown by the observers? What should I do with this exception? Because right now, if an exception is thrown in an observer, since I am in the firing thread, the firing thread can just, can just catch the exception, get it, and do something with it. It's not the case anymore if I'm in another thread. What if the observer needs to be called in a graphical user interface thread, for instance, the swing thread or Java fix thread? The choice has been made to follow the patterns for the completion stage and completable future from Java 8. I pass an executor as a parameter. Basically, an executor provides an, uh, a pool of thread. And what is nice is that it's a functional interface. I can implement it with a lambda expression like that. Nice pattern. What about the exceptions? Uh, well, we decided that the fire async call will return the completion stage object. So far, it, the, the, the parameter is the panel of data. We need to think more about the implementation. It might not be that easy to do. In that completion state object, I have two methods, exceptionally, which takes a function that takes the exception if the exception is thrown, and that can do something with it. And I've got another one, the handle method, that takes both a result. So as a bonus, I can get a result from an observer, even in an asynchronous world, and the exception if an exception was raised. Now, if more than one exception is raised, uh, we decided to put 
uh, all the exception in a in a in a kind of wrapping exception called the fire a sink exception, and all the the exception will be added using the the, the suppressed exception mechanism uh, introduced in Java 7. Great. This is that it. Events ordering very simple. We just leverage the existing annotation from common annotation. Just pass a parameter to it. The specification needs to be updated because currently you cannot pass parameter to it. Well, not like that. And it will be, of course, it doesn't make sense if you're in an asynchronous world. We could try to write a specification on that. It's possible, but it's quite complex and quite tedious to do. It's not sure if we're going to yeah. do that uh, just now. All right. And that's it. It's your go. AOP yeah. enhancement. Yeah. Uh, just to, to add the precision, uh, all the stuff that Jose just uh, showed will be in the early draft, so you will be able to test all this uh, asynchronous and ordering stuff. So uh, I'm going to go through uh, in a fast way, yeah. uh, through other uh, enhancements. Uh, a point that was asked uh, often is the possibility to add uh, AOP on uh, custom bin and producer bin. Uh, right now in CDI1, when you uh, create a producer or a custom bin, you cannot uh, put interceptor or a decorator on it. So if you use this kind of uh, code in CDI1, so hoping to produce a my service uh, transactional my service, you won't get it. What you will have is a produce service method that will be executed in a transaction, but the object return won't be a, a transactional bin. The solution that could be used to uh, solve this problem is to use the stereotype annotation we have in CDI. Stereotype annotation in CDI is the way to create a kind of alias uh, for a bunch of uh, annotation. So we are using a lot of annotation in CDI. And to avoid annotation L, uh, we provide a way to gather a collection of annotation and give an alias. So for instance here, I define a transactional bin annotation, define it as a stereotype. You see the, if I, no, I, I can't. Uh, you see the add stereotype uh, meta annotation and we added the transactional. So we are saying that all the, all the type that will be uh, annotated, annotated with transactional bin will have the add transactional annotation. So we could declare our producer like this. Instead of putting directly transactional saying, okay, this method is transactional, use the add transactional bin uh, annotation on it. It could be a solution to solve that. Another point uh, related to AOP is the fact that when you are in a bin, uh, in a given method, and want to call another method, which has an interceptor, like it's done here, you are in a calling method and you are <coughs> calling the logged method, uh, interceptor won't be triggered. So here, the uh, at log interceptor, which is on the logged method, won't be called because you are in the same bin. So a solution to solve that could be uh, using the self-injection pattern. That's the, the solution we've got right now. So using a uh, self-interface, uh, in allowing the bin to inject itself, and instead of calling directly the method, using the injected self to uh, call the method to help trigger the the interceptor and decorator on the, on the bin. Again, it's working stuff, so if you have input on that, we are okay to, to, hear, to read it. Another point we want to, to work on, and I finished with that, is to enhance the SPI in CDI. Uh, a big uh, part would be to allow the registration of bins at runtime. At, uh, currently in CDI, when the container is running after the, the boot phase, you cannot add a new bin in the, in the container. That doesn't mean you, can ask for, uh, you cannot ask for a new instance of bin, but you cannot add metadata for a bin in the container. Uh, some spec uh, need that, would need that. that. For instance, JAXRS 
uh, would like to use CDI, uh, more, more use CDI as a programming model. They try, but uh, there are some limitations. And the limitation is that in some container, JaxRS is up with the servlet engine. And when the servlet engine is up, CDI is ready to be requested, and the boot phase of the CDI container is over. It's closed. You cannot add anything. So providing a way to open the container, add a bin, and close the container could be a solution to, the, to that. But there are a lot of discussion. People uh, OK with that. People uh, really don't OK with that. So uh, if you would like to have those kind of features, you have to, to, sh to shout loudly and say, yeah, we need that. So we will be able to, to have reason and work to, to, to go that way. And I will finish with uh, something uh, more simple to, to do. Uh, it's to add helper for uh, uh, extension developer. So when you develop an extension, you, you usually uh, get, very often get metadata from the, the CDI container. That would be annotated type, uh, uh, bin, um, bin attribute, etc. And you need to decorate that. So right now, when you want to do that, you have to implement the interface annotated type, for instance, wrap the annotated type uh, you, you got, and implement all the, the method as, de as a delegate call to only override the method you need to, to have the specific uh, stuff in it. So adding this class for adding annotated type, bin attribute, and producer will help the work of uh, such developer and have uh, far more verbose uh, uh, code when you develop uh, annotation. In the same way, we are thinking about using the builder of uh, metadata we have in uh, Apache Delta Spike by uh, putting in the uh, event of the boot phase uh, of the container. Here, you, you see the after bin discovery is one of the last events of the uh, bootstrapping phase of the container. And in this uh, event, we would like to add a possibility to uh, request for a builder of a bin. And in the builder pattern, add the type, add the qualifier, and after that, uh, build, the, build the bin. Uh, right now, to do that, it's uh, very cumbersome. You have to, to do the same, uh, implement interface, and so on. And to finish, a uh, top quick win feature we we, we probably uh, add very fast is to provide a way to activate and deactivate context uh, for third-party users. Uh, right now, if another uh, specification or framework needs to use uh, one of the built-in context that we have in, in CDI, for instance, uh, request context, uh, they have to build it from scratch. For instance, let's say WebSocket need uh, to use the, the request context. They could use the request scope annotation, but it's, uh, it's a very small part. But regarding the context, they will have to rebuild it from scratch because they cannot use the built-in and say, OK, in this case, it's active. In this case, it's inactive. That's only for the reason uh, that, for this reason, that they cannot use it. And I think we're over, nearly over, because we still have the alignment on Portland Three. <laughs> zero eight. We need we need to look into that. Yeah. Okay. To as a conclusion, CDI two needs you. Uh, as we said at the beginning. Well, we are very open to the community. You don't have to join the expert group to come and give your idea, your feedback, and so on. When the early draft will be out, you, if you are on the Twitter sphere, you will hear about it. If you go on the website, of course, you will hear about it. There will be a blog post about the features. And grab it, test it, give, give uh, us your feedback. And if you want to, to join, you're welcome. So the website is your main entry point. Thank you. Thank you.